guest today is Mo Fox. Welcome to Manage Self, Lead Others. I've known Mo Fox for many years uh, as a colleague in, well, it was called National Speakers Association of Australia, now Professional Speakers Australia. And she presented at our convention, as well as actually creating this um, uh, transformative artwork that she painted, a very large piece over the course of the convention. And subsequent to that, she's published a book called Wicked Wisdom, uh, Creative Approaches to Problems That Drive Us Crazy. I've known her when she was traveling all around Southeast Asia, delivering workshops on design thinking, mm -hmm. um, mainly in Singapore or, or all over, was it? It was, it was all over. There was a lot of Japan, Singapore, Korea, and then nicking off to Europe and South America as well. It was, uh, it was great fun. Well, I would say that uh, Mo Fox is probably Australia's expert in design, Ooh. creativity, and wicked problems. And Mo, today I thought we might talk about or start talking about wicked problems because haven't we got such a wicked problem in 2020? But what makes it wicked and why not just a complex one? Oh, well, yeah, COVID is absolute. I mean, COVID is a poster child for wicked. So, by the way, was the US elections, the whole thing. So if you want to really understand where we're at, then they're perfect, perfect examples. So um, uh, I make the distinction between simple, complex and wicked problems. And simple are really straightforward. Complex are kind of mechanical or technical in nature. So, you know, you can map out a system, figure out what links to what, what the root causes are, and then you can solve them. Um, wicked problems are completely different. Wicked problems you cannot provably solve. There are lots of possible solutions. And so if you think of COVID, you know, there's lots of ambiguity. Uh, you know, we've got loads of information. We don't know what to listen to, though. We've, and we've got huge gaps in our information. Um, it's chaotic, so it's changing all the time. Uh, you know, think of how fast all the rules or our understanding have changed, how our lifestyle has changed, how the way we work has changed. Loads of people involved. Everybody's got a different opinion. Um, I'm sure you've never dealt with any of that, Nina, in your life. <laughs> any 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 key stakeholder any key stakeholders you know everybody battling um everything's in intertangle uh, entwined it's interdependent and and you know it's personal because it's not objective we tend to assume problems are objective and that we all see them the same way but you know you just have to have a conversation with anybody about covid or the us elections to figure out that everybody's got their own take on it. And you know, from conspiracy theories to science to you name it, everybody has an opinion. And everybody and, has a different emotional response as well. Yeah. I've been seeing people post on, on uh, Facebook about, oh, you know, I haven't really felt like doing anything. And this is the first creative piece I've done in months. And I just feel like crawling up in a hole. And, and I, like me and a lot of other colleagues, it's like, wow, this is the time that we needed to get out of our businesses and into innovation and creativity. And isn't this incredibly potent and creative time? So you're getting the whole gamut. And of course, there is misinformation around uh, what causes it, uh, what you can do to avoid it, uh, how to respond to it. And managers leading teams they must be tearing their hair out because they're dealing with all the human emotions yeah. as well as the issues. The, the... And and this is and this is what's um this is what makes it really challenging at the moment. And you know, that spectrum that you just described. Um, so if you see the biggest issue with wicked problems is that we don't accept that they're wicked. We think that they're complex. So we try to treat them as if they're something else. So if you are assuming, for example, the whole work from home thing, if you're assuming that that's a complex problem, it's a logistics exercise, then it's just about making sure that everybody's got the right setup, you've got the right software, everybody's kind of keyed in, you know when the meetings are, yada, 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 yada right? And then there's this assumption, and you can hear it in people's voices, of what's the new normal? Can, can we get back to the new normal? Can we, you know, now that we've got all that under control, the milestones are back on and they haven't reprioritized the projects they haven't and yet half the people are doing what you just described which is oh 
you know, I'm, I'm now dealing with so much else. Um, I'm now dealing with my family. I, I'm, I'm homeschooling. I'm doing you know, X, Y, Z. And their whole lives have become more complex. And, and they're getting what is it. And I was experiencing this as well. Um, it, it's like a the surge capacity is depleted. So you're, you're getting through the logistical part, but you don't have the emotional capacity to deal with anything extra or even anything in any real depth. And so if you've got that whole gamut, and I've spoken with so many people who are going, they just expect us to be, that, that they expect things to be normal and they're just not. And nobody has the, the will or the energy or anything to be able to, to contribute to it. It's really hard. Mm. And as you say, everyone's different. And of course, it's all about how you frame the problem because you see, until I, I came across your book, Mm. I wasn't even aware that there was such a thing as a wicked problem. What is the characteristic of a wicked problem that identifies it as wicked as opposed to complex? And these are the smaller issues that come up maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And look, by the way, a wicked problem can be you're setting up your, you, you've decided that during COVID you're going to get fit, for example, and you've decided a whole new exercise regime and you're going to do it. That, that's a wicked problem if you don't want to do it. You know, that, that, that feeling of waking up in the morning going, Oh, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> maybe tomorrow, or yeah, or any of that, or, or how are you going to get on? A wicked problem could be, um, you know, if you have a, a different identity or persona, if you show up differently at work usually than the way you do at home, and all of a sudden you've got both of those smashing together, and your work people are seeing you in your home environment, your home people are seeing you, you know, that, that all. So the small ones are just as messy. Uh, COVID's just, you know, a super wicked problem. That's you're you're getting into enormous territory. Um, What's been they're messy? They're messy. That's the fastest way to tell. They're messy. They're not complicated so much as messy. When, when you've been doing your workshops, what is yeah. the pattern in terms of the problems that uh, people in the workplace bring up that they're trying mm -hmm. to deal with? That is wicked and not co just complex. Okay. Um, why can't I use the same techniques to do a change management plan that I did before? Why can't I get people to do what they say they're going to do? Why can't uh, you yeah, managing a high, trying to put together a high performing team, build a culture of innovation. We're supposed to be doing a transformation project and I can't get anybody to do all the things they've guaranteed to do. I've got buy-in on a project, but for some reason it's stalling. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost anything to do, you know, the secret, and it's a cheat, but it's almost any time you're trying to get, any time your outcome depends on other people's behaviours or beliefs. Okay, so... It's going to be wicked. Because over the years, when, when people talk about compliance training, and yeah. the yes or no, they do know it or they don't know yeah, it. Yeah. When we do soft skills training, like raising emotional intelligence, it's like... Mm -hmm. How do you know whether they've raised their emotional intelligence? <laughs> it's a bit like you don't notice clean windows, but you do notice dirty ones. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absence of bad behaviour is kind of a measure of good behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, w wicked is, is something that it's ambiguous and maybe it's never solved. It's like mm. maybe there's a, it's, it's incrementally better. It's just not as bad as it used to be. Is that how you yeah, Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you, people usually understand it better if you go through the personal stuff. So, you know, you can't, you're, you're raising a child. You can't solve a child, right? You just can create. <laughs> so, so raising a child is a wicked problem. A marriage is a wicked problem. Designing your career is a wicked problem. Um, if you've ever been depressed, and, you know, there's a lot more about that at the moment. I've certainly had it. Uh, you can come to a, the assumption with a problem is that, you know, our language says a problem has to have a solution. With a wicked problem, there are many possible solutions. But if you take something like um, depression, you can work out what triggered somebody's depression, whether it's your own or somebody else's. But understanding what caused it doesn't fix the problem. Sometimes it might be that you've just got you're, you're functioning fine on the surface, but it's COVID and there's all this stuff happening underneath, you know, it's this surge capacity depletion, you know, for the first, for the first couple of months of COVID, um, 
I like you were saying, oh, this is awesome. I've now got space to do creative projects, yada, yada, yada. This is fantastic. And and I have no, I had no creative umph at all. Everything was fine on the surface, could not get into the studio, could not even read a book and concentrate on it. And yet I had, you know, piles of books. It's my favorite. I had the space and the time to do it, but, and everything was fine. Like I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't know anybody who was seriously ill. It was, you know, I was in a pr perfect position, very privileged, could not take advantage of the time. And part of me is beating myself up going, come on, come on, you've got the time, you've got the time, you've got to do it now, you've got to do it. This is great. This is an opportunity. No, nothing there, man, nothing there. I can appreciate that because I think there was this creeping unknown and yeah. Australia, we've been fortunate that uh, COVID hasn't turned into a huge wave like it has uh, in other parts of the world, and God bless them all. But um, but there was this creeping unknown, especially early in COVID, where we wondered, are we all going to get sick? Yeah. Am I going to get sick? Will but there be lifelong problems? Will I die? And that, uh, apparently, the stress of that makes people forget what they used to know. Yes. So... <laughs> It, it takes away, it can take away your motivation. And what you've just described is perfect, Nina, because so if you've got a complex problem that does have a solution, it's basically kind of logistics, mechanical, and you know, you're looking for well, what's the answer to the problem. So, and what's the solution, right? What's the solution, which is what you did when you were talking about the, the you burst into tears. So a solution was I didn't get enough sunshine. So you can look around and see if you can fix it. When you're dealing with a really wicked problem, um, the question you've got to ask is, what does it mean? And if you listen to what you just said, well, well what, you know, it's, it's the when did I go back to work? What, when is it going to finish? Am I going to get sick? What will that mean? What's the impact? Uh, we don't even know with the, the COVID thing. Well, we're only coming up now with the, with the long haulers. Does it affect kids? Can you get it twice? You know, all of these things is what does it mean? And in that ambiguity is the stuff that creates stress for us. Mo, you talk about search capacity completion. Can you explain uh, de this, please? Uh, depletion. Oh, the, I got the, the phrase from an article that was out on Medium. Happy to send you a link for the show notes. It was brilliant. Um, but it was what I had been observing with most people, which is um, normally when we deal with a crisis, you get this, this surge of uh, adrenaline and you go, yes, and this and I can take advantage of this and blah, blah. You know, you, you're... You, you it's the above and beyond in order to rise to the occasion and if you stay in that space you know it's it's like a big cortisol hit and if you stay in that space if you're constantly on crisis mode then you just don't have the oomph to call you you've spent it all so you don't have the ability to jump up and do you know to to rise to the occasion again Wow. So your ability to respond to a crisis with your reserves is, is depleted and you end up with this bleh. surge capacity depletion is more about where do I find the energy to, where do I find the energy to deal with the crisis because I, I've used it all. I'm, you know, I'm just fried and most people have been fried too many decisions in too short a time across too many areas, worry about themselves, worry about their staff, worry about, uh, their colleagues worry about their family, worry about trying to get their parents to stay home and, <laughs> and not go to the pub. Um, you know, it's, it's that sort of territory. So that's about energy. The other is about certainty. And of course, managers are feeling the pinch because up until now, they probably thought their job was focusing on results. Yeah. They're being told they have to focus on supporting their people and they need support themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure they have their own cohort of peer support as well as the ability to support their individual contributors look i want to ask this question around uh some business thinking suggests to focus on fixing constraints mm -hmm. I'm of eli goldratt and his book mm -hmm. the goal which is theory of constraints that the way you improve things is like the 80 20 rule if you yep. 20% of things that are a problem, the 80% of everything will, will, will fall into place. But design thinking suggests focusing on your strengths instead. So can you talk to that, please, Mo? Well, the Pareto principle. Um, so the 80-20 is really interesting. It's actually, that's a really interesting one to bring up because 
my understanding of the theory of constraints piece is very much it's it's hand in hand with the um, continuous improvement kind of efficiency methodology a lot of which is very factory driven you know if you look at the mental model that sits underneath it it's quite factory driven and uh, logistics driven and it's heading towards a, com a set of complex assumptions so it works incredibly well if that's the scenario that you are in um, the way that we would flip it is probably still 80 20 but we're focusing when you're when you're in a really fluid state so if you're in a if if your mental model is one of manufacturing or factory and efficiency and productivity, the assumption is that the environment is stable when you make the changes that you make. So you've got constant improvement, every improvement stays and you build on it. When you're in a fluid situation, you have to flip it. So you're looking at 80-20 still, but you're focusing on the 20% of your the stuff that is really important, and that in turn creates the 80% of the benefit that you're getting. But it's not about fixing the constraints, it's focusing on the 20% of, uh, you know, what are your key principles? What are, what's, the, what's your number one objective? What's the stuff that's working really well for you? So the tendency, I remember when um, my daughter was in school, I think I actually mentioned in the book, uh, the the headmistress gave gave a really surprising speech at one point because you know the parents were really keen on tutoring their kids and blah 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 and uh, she said if you're going to get them tutored tutor them in the thing that they're really strong at so that they can be brilliant don't tutor them in the thing that they're really average at so that they can just be a bit better than average and i thought that was so important because it's so optimistic and we forget the strengths that we have because we're trying in a work environment because we're trying so hard to control everything. Whereas actually the energy and the power and the imagination and the, the innovation and all of that comes from doing what's important well and taking how people work naturally and their strengths and letting them fly with it. Absolutely. And one of the things that I've done as a leader with uh, my small team is mm. when I've been uh, maybe going through a meeting and assigning the priority tasks. Yeah, I'll, I'll sometimes have a one-on-one -on -one with that uh, there to uh, uh, action list, and just say, "Is there one thing on this list that you really dislike doing?" Have yeah. you heard? Because I can actually assign this to someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm always relieved when they say, "Oh no, no, they're all good." But yeah. occasionally, one person will say, "Well, Nina, I actually don't like doing ABC." I say, that's fine. I've got someone else who'll probably thrive on it. He so loves it. <laughs> you just, I just have to ask the question. Yeah. A manager, and you just have to be honest and tell me and not know that I'm going to think that, uh, you know, that you're, you're shirking your duties. Yeah. We can't love everything that we do, especially if they're assigned. So. No, no, no. And then if you add to that, then what's the thing that would really get your rocks off? You know, what's the piece of work that you love doing the most? And you and you give them more of that, then they're going to give you more of themselves. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and I've seen that myself because I have uh, a few different part timers that come in, and I give them different tasks, and I can always flip them around. Look, just in in closing, Mo. I mean, what's the the? Is there a book that managers should read? Is there an activity that they should ensure that they bring into their meetings? What's the one thing that leaders can do at work, in the workplace, that will kind of get people to shift into this design thinking mode, if, if it's possible? Oh, only one thing, Nina, only one. Um, I, there, there are actually, can I give you a couple? There's got a couple. One, one of them is to focus on what you want to create. What's the outcome you're after? Like what's the, not, not focusing on the problem that you're getting rid of because that's just, you know, that's a drag. Focus on, well, what is it that you're trying to get to? Because there's not going to be a direct line from here to there. So if you can get everybody focused on that, that's going to inspire and also direct your action. Uh, and the other is to sit in the space longer. Uh, we have this, we have this auto response. It's like we play whack-a-mole with problems, you know, here's a problem, I've got to fix it. And there's the, you know, it's this constant keeping it down. Um, we assume that our job is to fix as many problems as possible, as opposed to 
work out what the right issues to be focused on are and and to understand them better. So sitting in the problem for longer instead of just knee-jerk reacting will get you a lot more depth. So focusing on the positive, on what you want to create, and then being willing to sit in the in the mess for longer so that you can really see and feel how it works. And then it's just a matter of course correction. So you don't execute, you try something and see if it works. And if it does, awesome, do more. And if it doesn't, awesome, do something else. You know, that whole take some risks in, all over. In Cotter's eight, uh, uh, eight Steps of Change, and he wrote this book yeah. called um, Our Iceberg is Melting. Yes. He created this character called the no-no or no-no. And he said the no-no is the person that says, can you guarantee 100% that this new action is going to work? Yeah. Is that stifles innovation? That's oh, totally. correction. You've just got to take a step and know that it's either right or wrong. And if it's wrong, just backtrack and try something else. So, or, or that it's it, it, right or wrong doesn't matter. It's either useful or not useful. And you know, something that's 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 useful in one context isn't going to be useful in another. And something that worked brilliantly in one context won't work in another. So it's like. It, it, is it, has, is it working? Isn't it? Is it adding value? Isn't it? And it's then it's not so judgmental because right and wrong sounds like a failure thing and people get really nervous about that. It's just, it's the thing I love about Australia is we have a kind of a suck it and see mentality, you know, I'll give it a bash, give it a go, give it a shot. So it's kind of more of that. Let's see, then what can happen? It'll either work, it won't work. Cool. And on your um, video channel, you talk about a three-step model that begins with look. Can you describe? That? <laughs> uh, it's it, this is a classic. This is um like the metal. There are so many design thinking models out there, and this is like the meta model that sits underneath all of them. And it's look, think, and do. So take some time and and see what's going on and get lots of information in. Um, do your research, ethnography, whatever. <clears throat> think is reflect upon it uh, what does it mean and then you know start coming up with maybe some ideas and then do is try stuff out because you can't work it out by analyzing it beforehand and then executing you gotta suck it and see and navigate by doing and it's um i see it as a you know <laughs> i'm drawing in the air on a podcast i'm not sure that that works nina um but <laughs> see it as a loop going back and forth and then in the middle for design things so you know you might try something out doesn't work so well so you go back to reflection or you go back to thinking about oh I need to do some more research in that stage or you try something out and it works but it asks more questions so you go around again and and the thing that we got to remember if you're doing something with design thinking because it's very human centered the human centered bit is the most important thing about design thinking is that it is always around empathy you know who are we designing for who are we designing with you know who are we collaborating with why does this stuff matter to them and then you're doing the creation piece with meaning and with purpose and that's what makes design thinking so powerful because there's a, a thing called empathy maps that yes. uh, draw it up and take it into account. Look, um, uh, I just want to say, Mo, this, uh, honestly, I feel as if we could talk for another hour. <laughs> easily, easily. Big topic. And I've always been intrigued by design thinking. I've been reading your book, Wicked Wisdom. But Mo, you're also available for organisations for consulting, yep. uh, training, um, and, and uh, just the whole uh, gamut. So talking to you has been fascinating today, Mo. Thank, Thank you for coming on. And um, uh, we'll post all your uh, links in the in the pod podcast show notes. Thanks Love for it. joining us in Manage Self, Lead Others, and uh, all the best. Oh, my privilege to be here. Thanks, Nina. Lovely to see you again. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.